This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability and a generous investment by Julianne Wrigley. And in that, some ideas of how to move ahead. One, we need to look for answers in the ways of the past, in the knowledge of the very poor, in the unproductive systems that we have discounted for so long in the arrogance of modern science. If I think of my own country, I see today cities that are growing very fast, and we're doing what you have done here, which is to bring water long distances. I understand you bring it from the Colorado River, um, long distance to, to, to your city. Well, we're doing the same, bringing long pipelines, pumping water, uh, piping water long distances. It's leading, as I said earlier, to huge conflicts between uh, the present users of water and the future users of water. Farmers say they will not give up the water. It is their lives. And so the only way for cities today is to really think about growing, but growing without water. We need to think about how we can do rainwater harvesting, capture every drop of water that falls in our cities, recharge the groundwater that is below our cities through our lakes and tanks. We need to return the water by recycling and reusing every drop of it. And so what we really need to think about doing is to reinvent the flush toilet. That we don't destroy the nitrogen cycle, which if you think about it, the flush to toilet is sort of the most mindless technology that could ever been developed. You take a little bit of human excreta, uh, which is actually uh, good in terms of uh, uh, manure, nitrogen, phosphorus. You take a lot of clean water to first flush it. Then you need a lot more clean water to, to convey it. And then you treat it and you dump it back into clean water. Whereas what you would actually think of doing was to take the nitrogen cycle and like the carbon cycle, we need to think very carefully that we don't disrupt it. That that nitrogen cycle is about taking the human excreta and putting it back onto land. And that's really where that reinvention could come from the technologies of the past, which, which valued the, the every drop of rain to the technologies of the future where you would reinvent an affordable membrane which could actually recycle and reuse every drop of waste and turn it back into water. And that, to my mind, would be some of the solutions that could indeed be part of that affordable, sustainable future. But if you want to do that, and if all of us want to do that, then we need to look for answers in nature. We, in some senses, need to understand the sheer art, the science, and the strength of nature. I mean, you have to understand, I come from India, where the monsoons play a very important role in our lives. And as I said, I just discovered that you have monsoons here. So, so, so maybe this will not quite seem the same to you. But uh, for us, monsoons are a very, very important part of our life. But if you think about it, just think about the art of nature in the monsoons. It takes such a small temperature difference to carry as much as 40,000 billion tons of water from the oceans across millions of miles and dump it as rainfall in India as the monsoons. But what we do is that we don't take the soft power of nature. We don't look at the soft power of nature. We look for concentrated energy sources, such as coal and oil, that have created enormous problems of air pollution, of global climate change. But if, you, if we understood nature and nature's ways, we would actually shift to weaker sources of energy, like solar, or move to using rainfall, and not wait till it is concentrated in rivers and aquifers. And, you know, for us in India, we've been looking increasingly at seeing 
how would you make that decentralized water revolution work for a decentralized energy revolution? where you have very large numbers of people who do not have access to grid-based power. But today, the very notion of renewable energy, solar energy has been that we provide solar energy for the poor to keep them poor. So we provide it as a transitory solution. We don't believe in it as being the ultimate solution. So in most cases, if you, if you talk about solar energy and distributed solar energy, you will find it's about giving away a few panels and a few light bulbs and telling people, use it, but don't get a television set, because if you do, this system won't work on it. Which really means that you are keeping people, uh, you're making them believe that solar energy is only when they are poor, not when they are rich. And yet, if you believed in the way nature works, and as I said, the weaker sources of energy, then you would think about creating mini grids and micro grids across the country in which you could actually have a scalable, workable model in which solar energy could be, could be the source of energy for the poorest people getting the rich, the most expensive source of energy. And that really could be the transition, the leapfrog that we are all looking for. But that again would demand us accepting the fact that in the environmentalism of the poor, it is the poor who have provided us the space to breathe. It is they, because they do not consume, that they have given us even the opportunity to sit here today. So if there are any solutions that need to work, they need to work first in their world. It is their right to energy. It is their right to development that has to be secured. The question is how that right to energy and that right to development can be secured differently. And that is really where, to my mind, the answers will learn. So I think the answers are there for us to take, but they're difficult. But more than ever before, I believe that the time is here for us to take the future and make it the present. This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability for educational and non-commercial use only.